Amen. Well, so good morning. My name is Leslie, in case you didn't know, and I said that already today once, but I forget names, so I'll say my name again. We are so excited about this new series. Whew, catch my breath. How many of you love to worship the Lord? It's like the best thing in the whole world. Amen? Like there's just, there's just something about music. There's just something about music. There's something about lifting your voice. Whether you can sing or not, I don't care. There's something about lifting your voice to the Lord that does something, that shifts the atmosphere, that brings the kingdom of heaven to earth. So we are going to do a series on worship. It's called Holy Roar. How many of you are ready to roar this morning? My voice is going, so I may not be, I'll be, ah, good. You know, you know, you're like grateful for that, right? She, <laughs> she's quiet. We are talking about holy roar. We're going to talk about the seven Hebrew words of worship. And this week, Travis just randomly said this to me. He said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. And I said, who said that? Because I knew he didn't say it. I heard it before. Not that he's not that creative or good, because he is. But I was like, well, who said that? And he said, that's Jacob. Jacob said that. So I want to read that passage of scripture because when I was writing out the intro, I'm like, I got to read this. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Genesis 28, 16 and 17. The Lord is in this place. This is none other than the gate of heaven. This is the house of God. And I want to say that it moved from being the house of God, a building, when Jesus came, to your house. Not your house that has four walls, your house, your heart. Surely the Lord is in this place. Surely the Lord is in this place to meet every need. Surely the Lord cares about everything that I have burdening me today. Surely the Lord is here in my worship. Surely the Lord is there tomorrow morning when I get up. Surely the Lord is in this place. And I just thought that's so powerful. How many of you were here last week? And you remember me getting a vision some of you were here, some of you weren't. So during worship, the Lord gave me a vision and I don't have this happen all the time. Um, and it wasn't like a, anything weird. I'll just say that. But it was just, I closed my eyes while I was standing up here leading worship. And I saw a body of heavenly hosts of angels, literally like right above your head. There was like two realms in the room. There was this realm that we can see and this realm that we can't. And so when we were worshiping, I saw this, this angelic realm right above your heads. And these angels were all out crying out, worshiping God. And they were beautiful. You couldn't really see faces. They didn't look like human beings. They looked like light. They looked, but you could see like robes and, and wings, but they looked like, it's really hard to describe because it wasn't like detailed and it lasted for a second. But they were angels. I knew they were angels. And then I looked at you and I watched all across the room and I saw this heavenly host worshiping their hearts out to God. And then I see our people and I see, I see pain. I see hurt. I see some standing. I see some lifting their hands. And at first I was disappointed. I'm like, well, they're not worshiping like the angels. And then the Lord's like, no, that's not what I want you to see. That's not, I don't want you to compare. And so I, you know, I gave a word of encouragement just to worship our hearts out. And later that day, the Lord clarified the vision for me. He said, this is what's happening in their hearts. Because then the vision turned and I saw you all just, just like the angels, just worshiping God. And I thought, oh, that's what you want them to do. And he said, no, I want, I want them to know that I see their hearts and this is what's happening in their hearts. So whether we see it on the outside, whether we're able to physically express it or not, the father sees the heart. He sees the worship of the heart. And when he showed me that, I was just like, oh, wow. What a powerful thing that was happening in this room. What a powerful thing that was happening in your hearts. You can't judge by the outward appearance. But I also was challenged like, we are to lift our hands. We are to raise our voices 
And that's what we're gonna be talking about. So yes, it's good that it happens in the heart. It's good that it's happening here, but God is ready to see it come out in the expression he made you to express. How many of you grew up in a Pentecostal church? Raise your hands high like you're proud. Come on, Pentecostals. Okay, how many of you did not grow up in church? Raise them up, look around. How many of you did not, hey, a pastor did not grow up in church? Check that out. How many of you grew up Catholic? Awesome. How many of you grew up charismatic? Kind of Pentecostal, but not quite as crazy. <laughs> Doris, all right. Anybody else? Did I miss a hand over here? Kind of charismatic, but a little more tame, maybe? What about mainline, which would be United Methodist, Presbyterian, or Episcopal? Yes, raise your hands. All right. So not everybody raised their hands, so I'm confused because I think I covered all my bases. Maybe not. I didn't? What didn't I cover? Somebody tell me. Shout it out. Anything? Four square? Pentecostal. All right. So what I want you to do is I want you to take off the hat that says Pentecostal, charismatic, Catholic, mainline, what you're used to, and I want you to set it on the chair next to you. Okay. I want you to set aside assemblies of God and put it on the chair next to you. I want you to set aside Pentecostal and put it on the chair. We are Pentecostal through and through. We love the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you something. These titles, Catholic, charismatic, mainline, these denominations are not going to be in heaven when we get there. We will not be a divided body. We will be a united body. And so what I want to tell you this morning is I want you to take those hats off and I want you to set them aside. I don't want you to put on, well, I raise my hands sometimes, but we don't do that jumping around dancing in this church. Like that's for some other church. Take that off. Take off the, I can't move because I'll be undignified or somebody will think something ill of me or I'll embarrass myself. Take it off, set it aside. I can't raise my hands. This, this is my comfort zone right here. Can't go this high because then you're crazy. Can't go over here because then you're, you know, calling the hogs. I don't know, whatever. You <laughs> Have you ever watched the comedian that does the, like the different hand raises? Like this is the, I don't know. I can't remember them, but I was like, I can't show that because then everybody will think every time they raise their hands, they'll think about what that was. Set it aside. Because the father the Lord of all creation is here this morning and he wants to define your worship. No denomination. He wants to define it. Take it off, set it aside. Even what you think it should be, what people should be doing, what it should look like. Well, they're not enthusiastic enough for me at that church, so I'm not going to go there anymore. Or they're too crazy. Take it off, set it aside. The body of Christ will be in heaven. Kingdom culture is all out, all the time. Worship to the most high God. Let him define your worship. So we always, when we um, use anyone else's material in a series, we want to give credit where credit is due. And so a lot of the material we use is actually a book that was just published recently called Holy Roar by Chris Tomlin and his pastor, Darren Whitehead. And um, if you've never heard either of those names before, uh, Chris Tomlin, I've been listening to him since I was a teenager. He's a worship leader. Uh, many of the songs that we sing, many of the songs you hear are actually written by him. Um, he is known as America's worship leader. And it's actually, they have said, he is the most sung artist in the world over Justin Bieber, over the Beatles, over Elvis, um, that a worship leader of Jesus is the most sung artist in the world. And, and Justin Bieber does love Jesus. Yes. Yes, he does. So, um, yeah, but we just wanted to let you know, um, and we're reading through this book. It's what we've read so far is awesome. 
Um, if you want a copy of it, we'll, um, we can get you one so you can, can read with us. Um, I will let you know, and ushers, I didn't get to you this morning. If you were an usher, there are handouts back here, right below where John is sitting up here on the podium. At the end of the service, I need four of our ushers this morning to grab each a stack of those. We want to give you some scriptures, some personal reflection or group discussion questions, however you wanna do it as a family or in your own devotional time, to kinda just keep you reminded of and dig a little bit deeper into what we talk about for these next four Sundays during the Holy Roar series. So every person in here will get one of those handouts um, and, and, and apply, you know, keep, keep this going in your own personal life. Um, I love this quote. A dislike of enthusiasm can be one of the greatest hindrances to revival. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. A dislike of enthusiasm. How many of you would say, I am an enthusiastic person? Raise your hand if you would say, I'm an enthusiastic person. How many of you would say, well, it kind of all depends on the situation whether I'm an enthusiastic person or not. I think of my dad sitting over here on the front row. And generally, he would not be termed as an enthusiastic, wild kind of a person. But I have seen my dad on his knees pounding the floor of our living room while he's watching the Cowboys in the Super Bowl in 1995. You know what? Um, this also comes to my, and my mom and dad may remember this. When we were a family, we would travel around. Um, as a, as a gospel group. And we would sing at area churches and, and different, you know, fairs and area events. And um, I'll never forget the one Sunday, I can't even remember what church it was, but we were playing and I think it was on a Sunday night service. And you guys remember Sunday night services? Um, but there was a, a gentleman sitting on the right-hand side, a few rows back. And I remember thinking to myself, as I watched him, he looks like he is being tortured. I mean, the expression on his face, um, he just looked like everything we sang and everything we said was just as displeasing as possible. I'm thinking, man, are you, you know, are you worshiping? Or are you trying to pass a stone because of the expression on his face? And I remember afterwards, we, you know, they, they would um, sometimes have some fellowship afterwards and some food and cookies and different things. And he sat down at the table where we were sitting and I thought, here we go. Great. You know, and I'm only like 10 or 11 years old. So this is a while back. And he just went on and on about how much he enjoyed the music. And I'm thinking to myself, well, could you tell your face? Because what you were experiencing on the inside did not translate to your facial expressions. I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. Kind of what Leslie was just saying, but that quote, a dislike of enthusiasm can be one of the greatest hindrances to revival in the church and unlocking this expressive enthusiasm might be found. This is what this series is, is all on. The seven Hebrew words, the ancient practices of praise. It's kind of like how many of you know that in, in the New Testament, there are a few different Greek words for our English word love. How many of you know that? Here they are. Um, uh, storge, which is a natural love. Uh, philia, brotherly love. Most of us know that, Philadelphia. Agape, unconditional love. And eros, erotic love. Um, you can, you, for me, I could say, you know, I store J a Big Mac. <laughs> Hashtag golden arches, love it. But I agape my wife. But in English, we use one word for both of those. I love Big Macs. I love my wife. 
as good as Big Macs are, they don't compare to her. That's right. Right there. Okay. Uh, so that is um, exactly what the English translators did for the Old Testament, which was written in Hebrew, for the word praise. And they took seven different Hebrew words for praise and condensed them into one English word, praise. And so in each of these, each of these Hebrew words have a distinct, important, and praise-altering implication. And so for these next four weeks today, we're just going to do one. We're going to look at these different words of praise and ancient practices for worship that we find in the Psalms. One English word, seven different meanings. Because for the Hebrew people and for David and the psalmists, worship and praise was a whole heart, whole body expression. It wasn't just music. It definitely was not just something you did once a week on a Sunday morning. It was so much more, so much more powerful, so much more impactful than just limiting it to a church service, than just even limiting what praise is to one word because it loses so much of its meaning and its value. So today the Hebrew word we're looking at is yada. Say yada. Now you're all bilingual, okay? English, now you can speak Hebrew. Yada. Yada means this to revere or worship with extended hands, to hold out the hands, or to throw a stone or shoot an arrow. I saw many of you this morning raising your hands in worship. And I'm so thankful that. Lifeway Church is a church that emphasizes all expressions of worship. Because I was reading this, and this book is really cool in how it's put together because Darren Whitehead is Chris Tomlin's pastor. And he actually, in each chapter, he kind of defines the Hebrew and, and gives the background of the word and, and the application to how it affects worship. But Chris Tomlin then comes and he actually talks about a song that he's written that applies to each word. We actually sang it today. Holy is the Lord was the song that he shared. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. And he was actually talking about a story when he was growing up in church. It was a much more reserved congregation where you did not see even hand raising. And he shares how they were singing a hymn out of a hymn book one Sunday morning and how a lady in the church raised one hand because she was holding the hymn with the other. So she raised one hand in worship while they were singing that hymn. And he says how an usher walked over to her and said, ma'am, will you please lower your hand? You're being a distraction. Can you imagine that? Like, TJ, TJ. Lord. That, thankfully, we're not there. But that happens. And we're going to look, we're going to look a little deeper into scripture here. But I love that when, when David says, praise the Lord, raise your hands. It's not a suggestion. These aren't suggestions. These are commands. And the command of our Lord today is to yada, to raise and extend our hands in praise for the goodness and the glory of God. Is there any more natural expression of excitement, wonder, or awe than raising your hands? Think about next Sunday. When the Cleveland Browns score, a t okay, let's, let's make this a little more real. Eventually, at some point during the season, the Cleveland Browns are going to score a touchdown. 
And when they do, the dog pound is going to get up on their feet and they're going to raise their hands and they're going to celebrate, right? It's going to happen. Because there is no more natural expression of excitement, wonder, or awe than, whoa, raising your hands. We all do it. Maybe not in worship, but we all do it. It's almost a primal instinct coded into our DNA. And it does not depend on our skin color or what language we speak. And you're going to see it in just a few minutes. It is a global, universal thing we do when we are excited, when we are overcome with joy and emotion that we raise our hands in response. In the same way the Hebrew people would yada the Lord in moments when they were so overwhelmed by the glory and goodness of God. 111 times in scripture, we see the Hebrew word yada. Here are just a couple examples. They're on the screen. Psalm 67, three. May the people praise yada, you God. May all the peoples praise you. All people Remember, this is Old Testament. So in this moment, God had a very select group of people that were his people. And this psalm, and this yada transcends time and space to that it's all people. Jews, Gentiles, the Hebrew people, the early church in Acts, here at Lifeway. May all the peoples yada the Lord. Look in Psalm 44, verse 8. In God, we make our boast all day long. And we will, yada, we will praise your name forever. The people of God will yada for all eternity. You see, for over 3,000 years, yada has been an active posture of praise expressed by those who adore God. No matter tradition or denomination, it is an expression of those who adore, who love God. This isn't worship. This is worship. The heart. And what overflows from the heart is expressed through raising hands or bowing or kneeling or crying or standing still in his presence. Yada is an eternal verb. We see it right there. We will yada your name forever. It's an eternal verb, an eternal expression of our worship. I love this. I don't even know this hymn, but this is how they ended this chapter. Read these words with me. And with our hands lifted high, we will worship and sing. And with our hands lifted high, we will come before you rejoicing. With our hands lifted high to the sky, when the world wonders why, we'll just tell them we're loving our king. Isn't that good? We have a video for you. Would you stand with me this morning? (laughs) That needed to be heard. He said, I'm not going to be out worshiped by a whale, right? Is that what he just said? Wow. Are you ready to yada the Lord this morning? You see, he said the word yada is the extending of the hands. It is also offering thanks. It is also casting. The word cast was in it. So this morning, sometimes when we praise, sometimes it's a sacrifice because of what is happening in our lives. Stella, I know this morning you're giving God a sacrifice of praise because you're walking through an unknown. But I'm telling you, your da da this morning breaks the back of the enemy and breaks the power of sickness in your body. Your yada this morning, your praise, your thanks to God by lifting your hands is is a signification of surrender. That I don't have control, but God, I know you have me. I know you have me. 
I know you have this situation. So sometimes we have to set aside what's happening in our days. And we have to turn and praise because when we do that, when we turn our thinking from what, our, what we're focused on, what we're distracted by, when we turn our thinking, it shifts. It changes and God moves there. We shortened the set this morning before we started the message. We're going back into worship. We can't talk about worship and then not worship. We can't talk about you dying the Lord and not having an opportunity to do it. Here at Lifeway, we welcome you to raise your hands. If the Lord leads you, our children dance. And in my heart, I was doing what my Natalie does just as well as she does it too. If the Lord leads you to move, to raise your hands, don't do it because we're talking about Yada. Don't do it because we're saying raise your hands. Do it because it comes out of the flow of your heart.